Software Engineering Radio Episode 9, Remoting Infrastructures Part 1 and Listener Feedback. Okay, welcome to this uh, new episode of Software Engineering Radio. In this episode, Michael and uh, Markus will talk about a pattern language for implementing remote communication frameworks. Um, a year ago, uh, Michael, Uwe Stoon and I wrote a book on this topic. It's called Remoting Patterns and we basically cover the patterns described in this book. So the idea is to explain how remoting middleware things such as CORBA, .NET Remoting, and web services, how they work internally and how they're structured. So why do you want to know this? You want to know this because um, it's important to be able to use remote communication middleware sensibly. It's important to understand principles, trade-offs, and not just to know the APIs. It's also important if you want to optimize some of these middlewares, if you want to be able to set the right parameters, tune them, and make sure you can make... Uh, performance optimized use of the middleware system and finally in some circumstances you also have to implement such a middleware yourself um, because the available middleware systems don't fulfill some non-functional requirements for example if you're deeply embedded and you don't have many resources you might want to build your own uh, RPC broker uh, infrastructure and you have to know how this looks like and the patterns we are going to explain in this episode will help you in doing so. So the need for remote communication and the, therefore the need for remote communication middleware is motivated by the existence of distributed computer systems. Firstly, because uh, of remote user interaction, imagine you have a web client and you need to interact with any uh, server, web server. Secondly, because of system integration, because you have already multiple uh, computers distributed in a network and they need to exchange data with each other. And thirdly, because of non-functional requirements such as scalability, availability and fault tolerance, I'm sure there are even more reasons. Imagine a web shop that gets access by thousands of end users concurrently, but only several instances of the shop running a separate computer might be able to handle such a high load so this is basically like a physical limit of that one computer reaches and you need to distribute it across multiple computers um, so that you have also a higher availability in case one fails the whole web shop does not fail we already mentioned the term middleware so uh, we use the term remote communication frameworks or remote communication middleware interchangeably. So what is a middleware? Um, the idea of middleware is that it sits between the low-level uh, operating system, and in this case specifically networking infrastructure, and your application code. So it isolates the concern of remote communication. So it, it, it makes sure it transmits the requests, it, it adapts your specific interfaces to, to, to the middleware, so if, you're, if you want to write an application that, that uses distributed computing resources for the reasons Michael just explained, then a middleware shields you from, from most of the details of this remote communication and provides you a nice and easy to use API to access the remote objects or services. So if we talk about rem remote procedure calls, w what is RPC after all? I mean, I've, I've heard about systems that use the standard called CORBA. What is CORBA? I've also heard people say CORBA is dead. Can, can you first of all maybe briefly explain CORBA and then, and then in that way explain what remote procedure call middleware is? Yeah, CORBA stands for the Common Object Request Broker Architecture. It's uh, basically a set of APIs with uh, semantic um, that got standardized by the object management group and uh, for which you can have multiple implementations. Different uh, vendors and open source communities have provided implementations for CORBA. Uh, most common are the programming languages Java and C++, but there are also implementations in other programming languages. There are ADA mappings, COBOL mappings, so 
also languages that are not typically uh, thought of if you talk about mainstream distributed systems, right? So Korba isn't dead, I guess. It's just not hyped anymore. Korba is today used uh, in uh, application servers um, as the working um, tier doing all the remote communication inside um, the application server. RPC and also in, the yeah? also in the embedded world, I learned that uh, because resources are becoming a bit cheaper, even in the embedded world, um, Korba-based embedded systems are becoming more and more uh, ubiquitous. Yeah, that's true. And also the Korba implementations got uh, more lightweight. There is also a minimum Korba specification so that uh, Korba today is used uh, more and more in the embedded world, as you said, because of the resources, but also because of the um, higher level of uh, abstraction that got introduced in the past uh, four to five years. So before we go on and, and, and leave Korba behind for now, um, one last question. Um, Korba was intended as a standard for interoperable middleware. Did that materialize? Is one ORB able to talk to another ORB? Yeah, Korba has a standardized protocol on the, on the network, on the wire, and uh, there were first some difficulties uh, and the implementations uh, weren't so compatible in the first years, but in the past, I would say, five to, to eight years, that had been very compatible and no uh, issues regarding uh, mismatches in the protocol layer. There are also other approaches or other tools um, besides Korba that are used for uh, remote procedure call middleware. Do you want to elaborate a bit on them? Um, besides Korba, there's also uh, ICE, the Internet Communication Engine, um, which got uh, created by Michi Henning. Um, there is also .NET Remoting around. There's uh, Java RMI around remote method invocations. Um, and uh, for web services uh, implementation, uh, we picked uh, Apache Access, for example, in, in our book. Apache Access is a framework for web service development so one thing that's discussed by the community in, in this context is that more or less web service is taking over the remote procedure call middleware world. And um, I think a couple of things have to be said for that. First of all, not all web service communication has remote procedure call semantics. There are explicitly two styles of doing web services. One is called RPC style and the other is called document style, where the RPC style has this yeah, we call a remote method semantics or style and the document centric or the document style uh, basically assumes that you adapt a more message oriented approach where you exchange business documents or data structures between uh, peers. Um, so if we discuss web services in this episode we're basically talking about the RPC style web services. So are web service going to replace all existing middleware? Um, I think this is a highly uh, emotional topic and we don't want to go too far into it, but from our opinion, I guess it's fair to say that we don't think that it will replace all kinds of middleware. It's more like an integration protocol for systems using different middleware systems. For example, if you have an enterprise in which you use uh, some kind of TIPCO-based integration uh, software on the one hand side and, for example, CARBA in another system, then you can use web services to bridge the interoper interoperability gaps between th those two systems. Despite all the improvements in performance for web services, it's still true that uh, the XML parsing and uh, creation of XML data structures is much more work for the computer. It requires much more computing resources than using small tuned um, protocols like, for example, IOP. One thing that hasn't been achieved yet is that there is no standardization of the programming interface yet. So if you implement a web service using the Axis framework and you want to use the same web service implementation with another uh, framework, then your implementation might not be uh, compatible. You might have to adapt your implementation. Although, for example, in the Java world, there is, of course, all those standards, JSR, whatever, that define how those interfaces have to look like, at least in the Java world. 
Remote procedure calls are not the only paradigm for distributed computing. There are also other styles. One is, uh, for example, shared repository, having a database where all the distributed uh, peers access the common data, trigger each other to exchange data, to build a distributed system. There's also uh, the paradigm of streaming, basically video streaming, which is a different kind of interaction besides remote procedure calls. And another one is messaging systems, of course. Messaging systems are primarily used for large-scale integration of, of really big systems, for example, uh, the worldwide hotel reservation system or the flight booking system. As far as I know, they're all message-oriented. Um, so we don't cover message-oriented systems in this episode and also uh, not in our book. Uh, there is a good coverage of this in the enterprise integration patterns by Bobby Wolf and Gregor Hoppe. And we're planning to, to get Gregor on the line for an interview so we can talk about uh, messaging systems in detail with, um, with Gregor, who, who really knows what, what to say about this topic. Um, some smaller issues or some points we want to make, however, is that messaging systems are always asynchronous. So there is usually no association between a request and a reply. So you send a message, it's delivered, just like in the internet, maybe through several intermediaries, and once it arrives at the target, it's uh, accepted by the target, and the target starts processing the message. And maybe um, it sends an answer. So you have to be uh, prepared to receive the reply message asynchronously. So it basically um, requires a different style of programming. It's also possible to simulate uh, messaging middleware on top of RPC style middleware and the other way around. You can also implement uh, an RPC style middleware on top of a messaging middleware. One could argue that if you run Corba over the internet then it is just what happens but it's probably not a good idea to call IP a messaging middleware. <laughs> so, But it's usually better to design a middleware from scratch as a messaging system or an RPC style middleware because the trade-offs and the implementation patterns are quite different. When I get asked uh, on when to use a messaging system and when to use an RPC style system, it, it's always a kind of a tough question. One common g guideline that I give is uh, use a messaging system in case you have an event-driven um, application, when you have state machines driving the application logic, and use an RPC-style uh, communication when you have to integrate the result into your regular control flow. So when you, for example, have to fetch data from a remote host and uh, you need uh, result immediately for the next computation step. The different styles of programming, as I just said, with the event-driven versus regular uh, control flow, uh, have an influence on the programming model and the architecture. Therefore, the selection of the middleware has an influence on the architecture and vice versa. So, when you plan a new system, you should uh, think about the middleware carefully when selecting the architecture. It's not true to say that, you know, like uh, messaging systems are only used in really big enterprise systems. They're also used in those event-driven embedded systems. Right. Especially in, in unreliable uh, environments when uh, the nodes, the computing nodes could easily fail. RPC-style programming can get quite cumbersome because usage of uh, timeouts, retrials, and you need to cope then uh, typically in the application logic with that. Then that can make the application logic quite complex. Okay, and just to get some of the terms straight, um, if we say that we use messaging in embedded systems, then of course we don't talk about those big, big messaging systems like TIPCO Enterprise or uh, IBM's MQ series. It's just the same programming style in that you exchange events or, or messages, but of course the implementation in embedded systems is much, much different from, from those enterprise-grade systems. Just to make sure it's, it's, it's straight. So, so 
in in the book and also in this in this discussion here, um, we'll shortly introduce patterns that form a pattern language. So um, we talked already about patterns and pattern languages in episode one of Software Engineering Radio. As it happens, it was also Michael and, and me. So um, just to really briefly restate what what a pattern language is. So a pattern is basically a proven solution for us for a problem that happens all the time in a certain context. So if you want to build middleware, then there are a s number of problems that you will always have when building middleware uh, systems and um, our patterns try to help you to to solve those problems in a, in, a, in a proven way. And a pattern language is basically um, a set of related patterns that build on each other. Um, in our case, the pattern language helps you to step-by-step step build a remoting middleware infrastructure. And um, so what we're going to do um, in, the, in the next, I don't know, minutes, hours, <laughs> is um, to step through the patterns that, that tell you how to build a remoting middleware. We not only reverse engineered the existing implementations, but Marcus was actually involved in several implementations of communication middleware. And I was, for example, involved and the development of uh, the ASOR, the COBA implementation, and open source implementation. So, so that's important to say that that patterns, also our patterns, are not something we made up, <laughs> but it's rather a combination of reverse engineering and our own experience. And that makes patterns quite useful because they are not nice theories, but they're rather uh, proven things from practical work. So um, before we actually look at the at our detailed pattern language, um, I think it's important to, to give the big picture. And the big picture for remoting middleware is that it basically follows the broker pattern. The broker pattern is something that's quite well known and has been explained in POSA 1, I guess, in the Pattern Oriented Software Architecture Volume 1, book by Frank Bushman and, and the other folks from Siemens. And um, so the broker pattern works the following way. You call something on one side, the message is being intercepted, it's packed, packaged into something that can be transported over a network, then it's forwarded over the network to the machine or the process uh, where the server or the recipient of the message works, and over there the message in is interpreted and the method is called on the target object. And then the same thing works for the way back. The return value of the operation on the server side is being packaged into something that can be serialized over the network protocol and it's um, delivered back to the client where the middleware calls up into the application layer and, and, and returns the result. And what we'll do in the next episode is that we'll explain how all this stuff works in detail. Before we do that, however, uh, we want to spend the rest of this episode discussing some of the listener feedback we got for our previous couple of episodes. We've got uh, a lot of very positive feedback for our podcast. So first of all, thanks to all of you who, who gave us positive feedback about what we do here. Um, I'm not going to uh, read all those mails saying, yeah, this was good work and this is great and go on like that because I think there is no point in, in reading all the positive comments. Um, however, what I want to do is uh, take a look at some of, some of the suggestions for improvement and also uh, look at some of the more uh, funny comments. So some of the emails were um, regarding the fact that we do this podcast in English, although all of the members of the team are actually German. And so Patrick wrote to us, I think that's quite funny. He says, the most of you are definitely the most experienced and outstanding software engineers in Germany. Why does this podcast... Uh, have to be in English. It's ridiculous. Can't you just be proud of yourself and make this the first professional and serious software engineering podcast in German language? And um, actually, it was my idea to do this in English and not in German. We really want to get the word out worldwide. And actually, this seems to work quite well, because if I take a look at the download statistics, um, we can see that probably 80% of our listeners are actually actually not from Germany. And that's great. Another email in that same vein is the one from Sven. He says, when I listened to the first episode, I found it also strange to hear an English spoken podcast with German or Schwäbisch dialect. Schwäbisch is actually the dialect that I speak if I speak German. And uh, the funny thing is, if I did this thing in German, I would probably have to speak Schwäbisch even 
more so you would probably have a harder time understanding it even if you're for example if you're from northern germany so um, those folks uh, north of the mine in germany should actually be happy that we'll do this in english another email um, was also funny it said content aside this podcast is noteworthy because it is a german podcast conducted in english their intro and outro music seems singularly singularly german And so since I didn't know what singularly German meant, I wrote back to this guy an email and we discussed a bit about the music. And so anyway, so the the, the music is actually something we got a, several emails about. So if if you like the, the, the music or the style of the music, you might want to check out Henning Pauli's website. He has a band called Chain and the intro and the outro is actually from an album called chain.exe so that's even a bit geeky uh, the, the the album title but that's not the reason why we chose it I actually really like the music and so so that was our choice another piece of feedback with regards to the music that we got from several people was that the music is too loud and yeah um, we turned the volume down Although I like the music, we turned we turned the volume down. So in this episode and also in the two previous episodes, you should have noticed that the volume of the music has been turned down. Another thing that somebody mentioned on a blog, I think, is that the folks doing this podcast are probably somewhat more from the Java side of the fence. Um, I'm not sure that there is a fence between Java and, and .NET developers, but yes, true, uh, most of us have more experience in the Java world. So in, in, in situations where we have to come up with a spontaneous example, uh, usually it's probably going to be from the Java world. However, we really try to make this podcast not in any ways Java specific and we'll, we'll make sure that we cover .NET topics uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a sense it, or generally non-Java topics in, in, in the right proportional. So we have uh, an interview with uh, an interesting person from the uh, C-Sharp community in preparation And also, we are planning to do a lot in the functional scripting languages area. So, yes, we are somewhat Java biased, but we try to avoid making this Java specific as good as we can. Although sometimes it's going to crawl through. There was also some other feedback that um, basically addressed the level of prerequisites or the experience level that we assume of our listeners. So, one comment was that software engineering radio will probably not be of any real interest to anyone except software developers. And yes, that's true. That's the whole point. It's not going to be interesting for anyone except software developers and hopefully it will be it will be interesting for software developers. The email went on or actually it was a blog statement so the the, the blog statement went on um Again, it ends with, this podcast is definitely not for the software beginner. And yes, this is true. We, 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 we try to address what we call the professional software developer. So people who do have some experience or who are studying computer science or software engineering. So people who have experience. On the other hand, we don't want to make this an expert's podcast so that nobody understands what we're talking about. So what's really important for us is that you give us feedback, not just on the topics you'd like to hear, but also on the depth or the level of detail that you think is useful please let us know what you think and i'll make an ad announcement on this uh, at, at the end of the show so we'll have some we have some prizes for people who give us feedback so anyway let us know what you think about the level of detail and um, we can adjust uh, the level i guess to some extent another piece of feedback was with regards to a discussion forum so um On the website, we do have the uh, facility for you to leave comments that everybody can read. But the guy who wrote this mail actually suggested that we'd have a discussion forum. Now, I'm not sure that this is very useful. There are many uh, discussion forums on the web and adding another one is probably not very useful because we wouldn't probably attract many people from those well-established discussion forums such as the serversite.com. And to some extent, we can also discuss using the comments facility. However, if you think that a kind of specific discussion forum with replies and threads and all that stuff is useful then please let us know and we can we, we will see what we can do so this was the kind of general feedback we got uh, let's now move on to some more specific things uh, in this case suggestions for future episodes um, for example uh, this, i don't know how to pronounce this name i'll try 
Kwais Taraki. I don't know. Sorry if it was wrong. Hi there. I love software engineering radio. Awesome idea. Can you look into doing a show about threaded application design and some of the design methodologies used in industry? Specifically, I was wondering how this alters testing and the time to release, moving from single thread to multi threaded. And um, yeah, this is actually a really important topic concurrency in general. And we're currently preparing at least two or three episodes on this topic, starting with the basics and then going to some quite involved things uh, with regards to building scalable servers. We also uh, are talking to uh, Luminary on this topic uh, with regards to giving us an interview. Um, You might wonder why I'm not mentioning names in advance. Now, you know, getting some of those kind of um, celebrities in the IT world for an interview is is always some of a problem, not because they don't want, but because they have a very busy schedule. So what we're not going to do is announce an interview with somebody before we actually recorded it because there can always things can go wrong and timing doesn't work and all kinds of things so we have an interesting guy planned for the topic concurrency and as soon as we have it uh, in in the can basically we'll let you know and we'll announce it but until then we're not going to mention names another guy his name is nanik um, also suggested a couple of topics or yeah, general areas of interest one was to discuss uh, experiences basically so like what was the experience in running a pro- project for example using the rup process or doing extreme programming or other uh, metaphors or processes or methodologies so um, not just explaining principles of software engineering as we do it right now but also take a look at, look at more experience related tools um, this also includes topics such as we used this topic uh, this tool on the project and it was good or it was bad uh, and also in that same spirit interview joe developer and or joe architect and get insights from those people about what they found useful which principles they found useful which tools they found useful which methodologies and yes we'll add these kinds of things however i think we'll first cover some of the principles and and then later in later episodes uh look more towards an uh, experience oriented approach although we do have some uh episodes in the pipeline that are more experience oriented Tools is somewhat of a problem because um, if it's a commercial tool and we say it's great, then everybody says they, they're getting paid for that. So it, lo- it sounds like advertisement. And if it's a bad tool and it's commercial, we're probably going to get problems. And if it's a bad tool and it's an open source tool, then we probably start a flame war. So mm, discussing tools is somewhat of a, a topic that has to handle has to be handled with care. I'm not saying that we're never going to do this. Um, For example, in the model-driven episode, I I mentioned the open architecture where code generator. But still, tools is a delicate issue. And I mean, I'm not saying we're going to ignore it, but let's see how this turns out. I'm not, not, we're not certainly not going to do tool reviews or anything like that. So some more feedback on possible topics um, from Jeremy from Israel. He suggests three topics. One is benchmarking how to test and measure, and how to see through the marketing fluff in commercial benchmarks. Yeah, certainly an interesting topic. I'm not sure we can actually talk about about this topic, so we might have to find uh, external people to interview on this topic. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we've put it into the pipeline. The second topic he mentioned is aspect-oriented programming. And yes, this is, of course, a very big to- topic, and we will definitely cover it. Again, we have... Uh, cool interview in the pipeline so stay tuned i'm not going to mention names but that's going to be interesting the third thing um, he mentions is building highly scalable servers considerations in threading models io patterns and yeah as i said this is basically in the spirit of the concurrency thing and we will uh, cover that in upcoming episodes probably not too far from here and I also have other interview folks um, uh, talk to with regards to building scalable internet systems. So we'll definitely address those topics. We also got feedback from a guy called Charles Weir. And that's interesting for several reasons. First of all, I know Charles for quite a while from the Patterns Conferences. And I have quite some respect for him. So getting positive feedback from him 
is uh, is really encouraging. He says, "This is good stuff. I've listened to the to the lot and have picked up quite a bit. Thank you." So this is really cool. And also, what's interesting is that he gives us feedback, almost like in in those patterns writers workshops. So first he starts with things he likes, and then he uh, gives us suggestions for improvement. So two of the things he likes is one is he likes the format conversation interview style so i think it's really important that there is not just one person rumbling around like i do now in the feedback but rather that there is this kind of uh, questions and answer thing that makes it much more lively and the other thing he says uh, he likes the music a lot and of course he says it could be a little quieter so i don't have to turn it down and yeah we, we did that and um, so now suggestions for improvement um, he says perhaps a little more on the examples And examples that are less meta. Um, so yeah, um, as you'll see at the end of part two of the remoting episode, we did add examples, specifically in this case, discussing Corba and .NET remoting. So yeah, we'll we'll add some more stuff in the example area. Another very specific comment he makes, and that's interesting, and I think you should you should take a look at that. Uh, he says, on a practical note, your number one episode on patterns references Linda's Patterns Almanac. This is now out of print, but she's handed the content to me, and I spent a happy few evenings scripting with Perl to produce a web version. It's at http wwwsmallmemorycom almanac. I'll put the URL into the show notes. So um, if you're interested in the software patterns almanac and you can't get it as a book anymore, take a look at the URL. So uh, there it is in online form. And thanks to Charles for actually making it available online. So now let's move on to the feedback on specific technical uh, topics or content we discussed. Um, the first thing I'd like to mention is feedback on the dependency management episode from Michael Stahl. You may remember this name from the POSA 1 book. He was one of the co-authors, one of the Siemens guys. And he says that uh, in our dependencies episode, we basically mixed two kinds of dependencies. And that is um, a public uh, official dependencies and implementation dependencies. For example, if a component offers a certain interface, um, then this is obviously a public contract, so other components can call it. However, in uh, for required um, dependencies, like this component needs this other interface to work, it's not that easy. There might be public dependencies that would result from a context diagram. So like this component needs access to some other component or some other interface because the whole purpose of this component is to do something with the data from that other component. So that is also a public required interface. However, there are also um, kind of unofficial dependencies. Like for example, if a component needs a connection to a database or other resources that are specific to the implementation of the component and that stuff is not the same thing so yes there is a dependency and you should make it explicit but um, it's different from officially advertised use case driven um, specific functionality specific uh, dependency so it's probably good to distinguish between dependencies that are important from a structural or architectural point of view and the other dependencies that result from an implementation uh, decision uh, and as a consequence you might need certain dependencies. So Michael is not just suggesting to remove those dependencies but rather to distinguish between those dependencies that are intentional because it's driven by what the component has to do and others that are accidental that are necessary as a consequence of the specific way how you implement the component. And I think this is a really, really good point and we completely missed it. So take this to heart and, and consider that having those two different kinds of um, two different kinds of dependencies. There was also feedback on our scripting languages episode from Sven. I don't know which Sven, it just says Sven. Although you can catch all of the errors usually caught by a compiler with unit tests, it's a big difference to have the errors automatically show up as you type, like in modern Java IDEs, instead of always running the tests. Additionally, I think tool support in general is a very important thing. Unless the language is statically typed or the IDE memorizes runtime types, it's impossible to have good refactoring and code completion support, isn't it? So this might be a very strong argument. Um, so first of all, uh, since 
Alex was the guy who basically um, contributed the content for the um, scripting episode. I'll read his reply. Thanks, Sven. Yes, you're absolutely right. Tool support is so much easier with statically typed languages and tool support is one of the key performance factors in my opinion. Now that I'm used to refactoring browsers, I really hate to program, pro to program without one of them. On the other hand, I think it might also be a problem that we are just too much used to implement these tools the way we implement them now. Dynamic languages offer a lot of other possibilities there. For example, for method completion, intelligence, you don't need an AST in a static language. You could also simply just instantiate the object you need and ask it for its method names. This way, things might be a lot easier to implement than with static languages. But some interesting developments in this area um, in the next few years and different kinds of IDEs should show up. Actually, to, a, uh, to get a hint, take a look at the better Smalltalk environment. Smalltalk has the same problems, it's also dynamic, and it is not only the first factoring browser implemented, it's also a very powerful one. So um, I also like to add uh, one comment to that, and that is that maybe refactoring support is something you don't miss much if you work in dynamic languages. I don't have too much experience with languages like Ruby or Python, but uh, what I hear from um, other folks using these languages is that they don't really miss the refactoring support. So there must be something um, that, that compensates for that. And um, let's simply maybe wait for the episode with um, Alexander and Tom, who will discuss uh, the experiences of a Java programmer who transferred to using uh, Py uh, Ruby in a project. And let's ask him what he thinks about that. Another comment Sven makes is, I'm really looking forward to the next episodes on programming languages, especially the one about the new C Sharp features. I don't know why he thinks we'll have an episode about the new C Sharp features, but actually, as I said before, we have something in the pipeline and we will have an episode on C Sharp 3.0. One final thing that I found on a forum discussing the Ruby programming language, they discuss our podcast and they think it's great and stuff. And then at the end they say, they all seem to like Ruby quite a bit. And so there is the question, who is the sponsor and how much they pay for the words Ruby and Rails. And actually nobody pays us, there are no sponsors and uh, certainly nobody from the Ruby community. We just seem to like the language and there is obviously no money in that. So this um, concludes our reader. Uh, reader our listener feedback i'm still used to writing stuff and not to doing this audio thing so um this concludes our listener feedback and uh, we really want to get more feedback from you i think this feedback is really important and so to encourage you to give us more feedback we have a prize so and the idea is that everybody who gives us feedback in the way i'll just explain um will enter into a drawing where we'll uh, give away a book and since in this episode we're talking about uh, remoting infrastructures the book will be the remoting patterns book uh, written by uh, Michael Kirche, Uwe Stone and myself so um, this will be the prize and what you'll have to do is you have to give us feedback on uh, the software engineering radio podcast so you have to give us feedback by um, let's think by April 15th and the idea is that you give us feedback uh, either um, about three topics you'd like to hear in upcoming episodes or feedback about three um, things you liked or you didn't like in the past. So give us three constructive points of feedback and you'll enter into the drawing for the Remoting Patterns book. And of course, the way to contact us is either to write an email to team at se-radio.net or just simply leave a comment on our comments facility at se-radio.net and make sure that uh, you leave uh, enough information so we know who you are and make sure you we can send you the book assuming you're the winner. Right, so um, I think this finishes this uh, combi episode of um, remoting infrastructures, remoting patterns, part one, and uh, listener feedback. And we'll add this listener feedback kind of thing occasionally to 
um, give you feedback about the feedback we got from you. So thanks for listening and uh, see you next time when we discuss the second part of the remoting infrastructure. This was another episode of Software Engineering Radio. The Software Engineering Radio team wants to thank Henning Pauli for providing the music, as well as Lipson.com for hosting and bandwidth. For more information on the podcast, past episodes and feedback, go to se-radio.net. <laughs>